Hello, Carmen Brangy Show viewers. How are you today? We have a great show. I, today I'm speaking with Michael Turnbull about AI and design. But, we, but before we get into that discussion, I wanted to show you guys something. A little piece of good design that I come across on a daily basis. So some of you might know that I'm a somewhat of an avid cyclist. I like to bike around the GTA area. I like to cycle into work. And you know, cycling can be dangerous. Right? There are a number of cyclists killed in Toronto last year, injured. And you know, I've managed to stave off most accidents, but accidents happen. So I, I'd like to show you a piece of design that I think really really helps to prevent accidents by reducing error. Right? Because we know Jacob Nielsen in his heuristics, one of his heuristics is to reduce error in a system. So uh, where I am right now is on the Don Valley bike path by uh, Pottery Road. So Pottery Road comes down off Broadview and comes down here and intersects with the Don Valley path, uh, bike cycling path. So if you'll see across the street here, there's this little somewhat unique crossing, I don't know what you would call it, crossing intersection. It's for, it's for cyclists to cross. So if you look this way, uh, what you have to do, so you'll have to, you'll have to look left here on your own. I mean, the system isn't perfect, but you have to look. So the cars are coming down this hill. So you have to look for cars coming down the hill. So there's no cars coming, I'm gonna cross. But what this crossing does, so if you'll see, it forces me to turn this way towards traffic. Right? So you'll see as I'm coming down this pathway, I am facing oncoming traffic. So as a cyclist, I'm coming to this exit here and I'm being forced to look at the traffic coming this way. So there, this reduces the error of, let's say, looking the wrong way or not looking or not paying attention. What this extra little jaunt does is about 20 or 30 feet behind me, that's not really necessary, right? You could have just had a cross that went right across that intersection. But what we've done here is, we, if not we, but they, whoever designed and built this, made this little extra bit of uh, pathway that you have to go down. And what it does is it reduces the error of you not paying attention to traffic and not looking at oncoming traffic and then crossing into the traffic coming your way. Right? So let's say I'm uh, some Brit from England and I've come to this country and I'm, and I'm used to looking the other way. Right? Here, that, that potential, that air source of error has been totally removed by this design. And I think that's really great. I think this design has probably reduced some injury, possibly even a fatality. And so this is how great design can help human beings and help reduce error and help reduce injury. So um, if you have a chance, come on by. This is a great little intersection. If you're into design, come and check it out. I think it really reduces uh, injury. And yeah, let's, let's now head into our talk with Michael Turnbull. We're talking about artificial intelligence and design, and I think you'll really enjoy it. So welcome to the Carmen Brangé Show. Okay, so should we get started? Yeah, go for it, man. Let's do it. So um, thanks for coming on uh, the Carmen Brangé show, or is this, maybe this is the Michael Turnbull show. We're not really sure how these, this new media really works. It's, I guess it's kind of both, right? 
Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll find out, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I was connected to you through LinkedIn. I put up a, a podcast a while ago and one of my colleagues at Loblaws uh, pointed you out and said, hey, check out this, this guy. He's talking about artificial intelligence and design. And I thought, well, that sounds pretty interesting. So let's, let's have a chat about uh, AI and, uh, and design. I, and I've looked through your videos. I, I see you kind of branch a little bit out talking about kind of machine learning and things sort of in and around AI. So let's, uh, let's have a conversation because I, I love this kind of stuff. Cool. Yeah. I mean, they're all parts of a larger AI piece, right? The, there's no, there's no like one size fits all AI. And so everything from machine, mo machine learning models to like language models to GANs are all kind of wonderfully interconnected and that'll all help support us as designers. So ideally the, uh, the things that the, the whole like AI piece has like scary or as not scary as it is, all of it will in essence help us like, dissolve administration and make us a lot of, lots to be more creative, I think. I hope so. But so let's, I think, you know, AI is one of those terms that gets bandied around quite a bit. I think in uh, one of one of the consultants, they were, you know, they, they released those, the trough of, uh, it's called, the, you know, the tech, what's it called? The tech uh, progression curve. And there's like a big spike where everybody gets really excited about a technology. And then there's the trough of disillusionment. And I think, and I think um, artificial intelligence right now is uh, is at a is on a peak. I think. What do you? I I, I hear a lot. Of, towards that peak. I feel like. Yeah. I feel like uh, you know uh, currently I'm I'm listening to uh, Possible Minds, like 25 ways we can do AI. Um, you know, a handful of different um, essays written by different people, different data scientists talking about what exactly they think the future will look like. And I mean, I think. C considering that majority of this, like, I guess, science or even type, like, predating AI, cybernetics, and these ideas, they're all coming from, like, you know, the 50s and before, right? When we had these, like, kind of ideas of what the future could look like here. And I, I think they're really interesting. Um, so my assumption is this, is, like, you know, you probably, you probably faced this, like, a few years back, maybe a decade ago, UX was, like, a quiet, whispered thing. It was, like, shh, shh, shh user experience we're going to test people and it's like really scary and weird and crazy and then slowly yeah. but surely like we start talking about it we start talking about it and then all of a sudden like even banks now have like an entire ux division right yeah and it's like little, a little tiny increments and i think right now we're at the we're at the excitable part i think we have like quite a few years before we see any of that actually happen and then when we actually start seeing larger corporations start using more advanced or well i'll say more advanced you know put this in quotations but more advanced artificial intelligences with like backed up by deep analytics and all these other things i think what's going to happen is we're going to get this like uh, oh oh it's not that crazy or scary and that's when we'll hit that lull. but i think right now we're in the upswing like what you're when you're talking about here right right i've I've heard um, a good, uh, I guess you would call it an adage. I, I forget from who. One of, someone like Carl Sagan, something like that. They, w they said this about AI. They, they said, uh, artificial intelligence is always 20 years away. It seems to, it kind of seems to have done that because, you know, um, I read a book back uh, probably when I was a teenager uh, by Ray Kurzweil. Um, called uh, the Age of Intelligence, uh, uh, the Age of Intelligent Machines, uh, and in that book he talks about uh, you know machines creating music and art and and being creative, and he had a number of predictive graphs based on Moore's law, and he was extrapolating out to 2030, 2040, and making all these crazy predictions about AI. And it's interesting. I don't. I'm not sure if if a lot of it is really coming true. I think. I think artificial intelligence as a uh, as a as a global system, let's say, like a like a true human intelligence, is far, 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 far away. But I think what is coming and what's going to help us in design is those little pieces, speech recognition, um, the some of the things you were talking about in your in your video. So what let's let's talk about uh, generative antagonistic networks because that uh, it it it's it's pretty. It, pretty interesting to me. I've done some similar work, I think, in the past. 
Um, but so I think um, I don't want to lose my, my, my train of thought here. Where, where was I going? Let's go back a little bit. So, um, yeah, we were talking about um, AI. It's, it's always about 20 years away. And this stuff is kind of uh, it's it's it always seems almost within reach. And so what's what's coming up is is the little things, right, is the uh, uh, like Google, um, the Google voice, the uh, Google assistant works pretty well now, right? It can recognize my voice, it, but it's still limited, right? It's still pretty limited. It can't, like if I said, um, if I gave it a, pr a complex task that would take two or three steps or would involve some uncertainty, it would probably fail, right? It, it can turn on music, it can turn up the volume, it can change a song, things like that. It can recognize my voice, but it can't, it can't do a lot of things I think we take for granted as humans quite yet. And so I think when, you, when, when people hear about, oh, design and AI, I think what they're thinking maybe in their head is like an Android like data drawing out full uh, designs, right, for full solutions for a complex uh, problem set. Um, so let's, let's talk about that. The sort of the global, I'll call it, I don't, I don't think that's a, the best term, but global AI, like, like a full human AI, right? Versus I would say, let's call it local just because we're, we're with a global term right now. Let's talk about that and how you see those two, uh, domains affecting design. And then maybe we can talk about generative, uh, antagonistic networks a little bit as well. Sounds good. That's good. Uh, oh, um, I my audio is fine. Uh, you, your your audio is coming through loud and clear. And I think uh, let me just do a check on my my audio seems. I just wanted just didn't want to double it up on your side. Sure, sure. So you can still hear me now. Yeah, you're doing great. Perfect. Okay, cool. So okay, let's imagine we have this global AI, just like a human being possibility, and then let's right. have the the other side, which is what you're calling local AI. So sure. let's imagine two pieces. The global piece, the data like robot, which I love, I'm a big uh, Star Trek next generation fan, but um, data as a, as a creative, um, I imagine it would be much like, much, I mean, like the way the data is portrayed in these kind of concepts is like exploration and understanding. But if we had artificial intelligence that was like us, I think the big challenge would be um, there's, there's more about understanding. You have to, you have to imagine purpose, processing power every generation gets that much um, faster. Um, there's like a lovely talk on a TED talk called like um, the age of the age of machines or the age of M's E M, which is like uh, kind of like emotional machines or uh, like intelligent machines. The idea is that like a year to a robot is like the equivalent, like a year hour time could potentially be like a millennia. Uh, to us, uh, to them, right? So, um, within within the average lifespan, creativity from our side it would be completely. There's there's a possibility. I don't know if it's true. But there's a possibility that would be completely unrecognizable to us. And it's it's almost like it's almost like trying to explain to older generations what we do, what, like what kids do now. Like we talk about like Ugandan knuckles and like VR would never ever make sense to my grandparents, let alone I mean to me. I don't understand it, and so. There's this, uh, so I think like, I think it'd be very hard to understand by any means what that would be. If we're talking about creative process though, I mean, every every era, if, if it's today, because I can't really predict the future here, but if it's today and we had intelligent machines that could work at our capacity, I think the big thing for us would be, it would just be removing huge amounts of what I'll, let's call, I'll refer to as like design administration. You'd easily be able to iterate a thousand different logos. It'd be easy to uh, iterate a thousand different like um, websites or um, even potential opportunities. And I think yep. it's at that point um, in which humans take a big take a big step in where if we had this ability for somebody to kind of remove all of the ability to do like, to like execute, we can further execute or more specifically, which is the kind of the more interesting part is we can like see outside because one of the biggest restrictions I find in all of my, I guess my design practice or even in just creativity in general is time. You could have too much of it and you could yeah. have too little of it. And both of those things are good and bad. The challenge often comes down to when you have very tight restrictions, you don't have the ability to see outside of small, maybe even a ton of iterations. A hundred ideas today um, could be the gateway to a much better idea of that hundred and one. And it sounds really silly, but 
when I worked in the Valley for a very long time, just having 30 or 50 or 70 or 90 logo dr designs drawn on a sheet of paper was ensure that I could figure out the best thing for that client or um, make the best decisions when I moved in towards UX later. It's like, if I understand best practices really well and I come up with different variations based on different applications and I can pull that data down into me, then I can actually make much better decisions depending on my target audience. Right. Now, we have to also imagine too, right? Not every person is the same. So like, it's not just for, it's not just like, oh, we're going to parse all this data, pull it down and then submit it to everybody. And then we'll iterate on that. It's like, I can now make hyper specific design work directly to my individual audience. So you and I, for instance, are two different people and uh, a website might be more useful in one way to me and one way to you. And what we'll do is these machines, these, this AI will take a look at how you use all sorts of websites and takes a look at how I use all sorts of websites. And then what it'll do is take the same concept, something that I might've come up with as a designer, and then it'll reorganize and readjust things based on what you like more. So here's an example. Um, this is something I was working with with a previous client of mine. If you were to show up to a telecom website and you're at the very end of your like your your phone call life cycle, phone call life cycle, at the end of your uh, phone contract life cycle, this is the opportunity for a page all about like the Samsung Galaxy S10 or the iPhone to show you your phone in a comparison widget rather than a bunch of marketing material, right? The opportunity is now that when you land there, because I know that you're like a three-year three -year client at the end of your term, I should shift some of those components up. And then you, on your side, can look at it and go, oh, great, I have this older phone model as it is here in this section here. I can compare it to the better models here and then make my decision faster. And that allows you and I to do two different things. Technically, this is commerce-based, but this is what we'll look like. This is what this will look like when we're talking about design with this kind of AI in mind. As me, I might just be like, wandering around the internet, hoping to find something interesting. And when I get to that same page, it just shows me the marketing materials or shows me pictures of people who are like me with the cool hair or maybe skateboarding or something fun like that and shows them using that, local, that cool model on my local telecom website. Two different people, same website, two different outcomes. And then hopefully, if we do it right, we target them to the right place. Right, right. So it sounds it sounds like uh, we're not going to be out of the job anytime soon, and that it's very much an uh, you're augmenting a human designer, right? It's still very much it's a system that's very much human fed. So in this system that you're describing, I wonder could could uh, a current artificial intelligence technology would it be able to come up with those permutations on its own? Because I think that would be like, I mean, that would be challenging, right? Because how do you, how do you do a layout, you know, just um, based on, um, let's say, stakeholder feedback from a single stakeholder, right? They, um, they, they like this emphasized or maybe, you know, just trying to satisfy the basic rules of graphic design, um, you know, if, if you're looking at the different permutations of all of those characteristics, you could go wild, right? It could, it could be, um, uh, you could get almost infinite combinations. So it would have, so I wonder, like, have you seen any technology that could do that? Or is it, you're still creating three or four designs for a persona or an archetype or something, and then a machine learning algorithm or AI will then would pick between those. Yeah, so I think you have two things here. Um, let's talk about, I'll, I'll talk about your second piece, which is like, um, are there things that can do this now? And then I'll talk about the other piece first, stakeholders sure. and understanding of what design looks like. So right. it turns out that if you turn go to any website that you're going to buy a product, or if you're going to go to any website in general, most of them look exactly the same. In fact, most mobile right. designs look the same. So it's not actually that challenging to take a handful of screenshots of a thousand different websites and say that, yes. oh, you know what, it turns out that most of these websites have very specific sizes, most very specific colors, very specific other things. And that actually can turn into a series of templates. So yeah. in, in regards to that piece, like, don't get me wrong, stakeholder feedback can be stakeholder feedback. We could have one or we could have 10. And if right. they say like, oh, you know what, we got to remove the buttons, change them around, we could then pump them through a system like GANs, for instance. And then that will give us variations of what that can look like. It just needs to be tested in that regard. GANs is a weird one, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, because it yeah. doesn't just do things like faces, it also does things like molecular structures. So like pharmaceuticals are really stoked about GANs, because it's like 
I don't mean, I have no idea how this really works. I'm just like, I just play a scientist on TV. But uh, the idea here is that you take, you take a bunch of different opportunities for new drugs and you put them through the system and then it tries different variations out and it finds these new combinations that work a little bit better. Does it work 100%? Not yet, but it's those little tiny increments, right? It just has to be better more often than humans. So yeah. in, the case of, in the case of templated design or more specifically generating brand new designs, if you want to talk about like the the rules and the rules of design, how design looks or how things go, we can already see tons of that information as we are right now. And if we specifically use, let's imagine even running it through the classic old design pillars, contrast, color, mm. to, uh, layout, and so on. When we, if we have machines just totally look directly at that, we'll find really interesting insights that we might not have noticed beforehand. Because you and I definitely know very very well that sometimes my idea of what good design is and what your idea of good design is is not what a stakeholder is or not what the average user is it's right. just like kind of like subjective opinion sometimes too but we what we will find out is what's most um in this case most useful or most successful to the average person and as long as we're playing with the 80 20 rule here that's usually good enough um in regards to what things might do this currently so there's a handful of uh there's a handful of services that say they do these things very very well B12, yes. um, Wix talks about, they call it AID, uh, artificial intelligent design or artificial design intelligence. Uh, and then there's um, another, it's another fun one. Oh yeah, Luca over at, uh, which is a, I think is a Canadian startup. Either way, Luca does branding and logos. And what they say is you show up to the website, you type in what your, your industry is, and then you click a bunch of things that you think are really attractive. You give the name of your uh, of your logo, and then all of a sudden it pumps out a bunch of different ideas for you. This right. stuff isn't actually that hard, mostly because like we have so much access to like free tools online or like free images online. And if you just have if you just have people that are building really good machine learning models, and I mean all like, all they're really doing is clicking on a logo and like defining it as business or defining it as personal or defining it as like edgy or whatever. If they're properly tagged. And yeah. you go to the average website and you pull all these things, you pull all these cool different ideas. The model itself or the, the simple machine learning thing just pumps out what the most popular options are. And then I, on the other side, business guy goes like, ha, huh, you know what? This one looks pretty good. And because nobody else has taken this one, it's easy enough for me to just write it off. And then color variations and adjustments are really straightforward. It's only when it comes down to like, how do you apply this to, let's say, I don't know, a cool looking t-shirt. Most people are just gonna put their logo on a t-shirt, no big deal. If you want a little bit more interesting, that's when you might ask for human assistance in there. Um, they even offer, some of these companies even offer full brand packages. So that comes with a website, that comes with a bunch of other things. And what it really turns out is that because the web right now, specifically desktop web, Google's sort of still kind of figuring itself out, especially applications. But especially desktop web is pretty much locked. I haven't seen different, majorly different drastic ideas in web design in, I don't know, I feel like yeah. 10 years, but it's sort as of the soon as we had a big giant header, there was layout. a carousel, no carousels yeah. don't actually work for anybody who's listening. Um, yeah. We like clearly see that everybody does this and they've adopted these behaviors. So the average person is just going to get what they're expecting and then they put it live and they, it only costs them a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. So I, it sounds like you're describing tr uh, by training the computer by, by showing it current websites. And then in the middle is some sort of algorithm and then that would spit out uh, a potentially original website that's not existed before. I mean, original, we'll put in quotations here. Original, like, um, I would say it would be a website that looks different enough from their competition or close enough to their competition that they feel confident enough. Right, right. Yeah. So I actually, I, I did a project similar to this um, during my master's, I worked on an algorithm um, where we were trying to discriminate speech. Um, and what we were doing um, is um, we would, for every second of audio, we would extract uh, six numbers, right? We'd call them factors. So, for example, one of the numbers was how often the, uh, the audio waveform crossed the center zero line, right? It's called zero crossing. And that's a proxy for frequency, for example, right? So what we would do is for every second, we'd have six of these numbers, right? For every second of audio. And we'd have humans would come and we'd have them say, this second is speech. This second is not speech. This second is speech. 
And, and so that is how we were training it. And then I worked with this master's of com uh, computer science student and he had an evolver. And so what it would do was it would uh, come up with some rules based on the, uh, the features that I extracted. And then it would compare that against the human comparison. And it would churn out, so it would, it would try one set of rules and it would look at the results and it would, then it would randomly alter some of the rules and try again. So we were trying to basically evolve, uh, train the machine through evolution on what, it, what speech was based on these, uh, these uh, factors that we extracted from audio. So in a, a similar way, I can see how you could, it might be a little more than six, right? Because I think a web layout, a web design is, more complex than audio, right? Audio is just a single line of, of numbers, really, right? So, but you could do something very similar is just, if, is give quantitative values to certain aspects of the website and then have it uh, crawl the web, essentially, and learn. The only thing is, how would you know what's good design, right? There's plenty of, uh, have you ever seen, been to lingscars.com? Mm. Right, I use Link. I, think, um, I use actually, Link's cars as an example of bad design a lot. I think I think like there's I think there's a uh, two schools of thought here, and um, yeah, the uh, we'll talk about the good and bad design in a second. But uh, I want to a, a data scientist friend like kind of pointed out to me, which sort of answers this question about like training a model and how do we know what's like the most accurate? Because it doesn't actually have to be good; it just has to be more accurate towards a particular person um, or a particular particular right. group. And so if we think about it this way, right. like he always just is like, you have this giant block of steel and you want to carve it into like um, uh, the, what's it, what's David, is that the thinking statue? Anyway, um, yeah. yeah, and all you have is a pea shooter. So you sitting there firing one shot at a time takes way too long, it'll take an infinite time. But if you have a billion pea shooters and you keep shooting them at the same time, you're gonna see real results. And inevitably, like they always say, like this, the sculpture is already underneath. Um, this is 100% true when we talk about things like language models. Up until just recently, we have never been able to really do well with language, mostly because rules are really confusing, right? Why I say one phrase over another, context is so incredibly challenging, um, and also colloquialisms. As soon as I say something like, when in Rome, when in Rome is an abstraction for when in Rome do as the Romans do, and that's an abstraction from another phrase in another time period that we just use. We don't even think about it. Anymore. Right. And it's, it's different meaning. from when in Vegas, meaning. right? So yeah. they can't, they actually have like different meetings and different uh, structures. But because we have billions of data points now in regards to how language models work, or more specifically English, because it's the most popular language talked about on the internet, we actually see language models being incredibly accurate. Um, OpenAI's GPT-2 is a really good example of that. So moving over to the other piece, good design. So it, going through accuracy, right? If, even though some websites are completely terrible, the best part about that is that there aren't as many of them as we imagine. Most websites are designed on websites like Wix or they're designed on like, remember GeoCities or Angel Fire? Like, right, of course. They're, they're, yeah, of course, okay, yeah. who doesn't? Yeah. Um, except for everybody that was born in the 90s, I guess. Right. Uh, so if we take a look at that era, that personal website design of like just stuffing HTML and you know pre-CSS into like some space and hoping for the best is over. Right now, we see most people building and hosting their websites on things like WordPress, on other templated websites, and these things define a style. Most people are doing basically what everybody else is doing. So what we can do is we these models will take a look at all of these different structures and they'll go like, oh, more than likely, this is what most people want. And it'll start seeing that like because of page rankings or because of things like um, most traffic into an area. Articles should look like this. Um, like let's say like um, e-commerce websites should look like this. New products should look like this or should be displayed this manner or they're the most successful. And as those things change and as our models update, it'll just accordingly. Now the challenge is just because it's popular doesn't mean it's good design. And you'll know this. Sometimes things are really popular and they're not great. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna suggest uh, Avengers for anybody who's up to hate, it wasn't my thing, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm not really that excited about comic book movies in the way that like some of my serious comic going friends are. So even though they're like, oh man, oh, 
Hey, did you, sorry about that. I guess something quit on my side. Are you still there? Hello? Hey. Hey, we're back. Sorry, we just lost the signal. Yeah, it's OK. Something, I, I figured it was something that blew up on my end. Yeah. I'm just going to start sure. this real Sounds quick. Good. Sure. Again. Yeah, that's it's going great. We'll go for another, uh, can you do five minutes or so? We'll wrap it up. Yeah. We got on the video. Okay, we're back. Sorry about that. We had, you know, technical ghosts in the machines and whatnot. Um, so just to bring us back in, we were talking about, um, you mentioned something very interesting, which maybe we can, we can sort of close on, on this concept because I think it's very key is you touched on meaning just briefly as you were going through uh, what you were discussing before. Uh, even you said something, oh, uh, uh, an article should look like this. Or you were talking about when in Rome and there's so much, there's many, many, there's so many layers of context and meaning. So, and, so I would say is maybe that's a little bit more, that's almost more what I was referring to about the global and local is that I think a lot of these techniques that are coming on, you know, for design and all other domains are still unfortunately lacking meaning, right? We're still sort of doing a little trick, I think. It's not, it's not what, I would, what I would consider, maybe others too, true, you know, that lieutenant data, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, where there's, there's meaning. And um, so I think while these tools are gonna be helpful, um, I think it's just a little unfortunate, and to me as a, as a tech nerd, it's still a little, it's sad that uh, we still haven't figured out this meaning thing uh, qu quite satisfactorily yet. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm hesitant to suggest that meaning is hard to defer. So today, yes, it's, it's almost impossible for the average machine or, I mean, hell, the average anything doesn't really get meaning. If you've heard, um, weapons of math destruction, um, you'll know that like algorithms can't even tell whether or not information is fake or not about us. If there's another Michael Turnbull out there right. who's robbed a bank, my credit score is affected. So yeah. it's like, we're not even good at that. Yeah. Yet. But one day we will be, or, or one day we'll all just die. But even in the, in the, along the way, we're going to kind of stumble over some areas in which we'll figure out regulations or we'll figure out uh, tools, we'll figure out some now, there is, a there is a division, before we divide into what is this like meaning robot, there's a division between two different things. If we keep artificial intelligence as intelligent and like life forms, or if we look at them as tools, and that actually decides two different pathways. But if we look at things as like as intelligent beings or as something that, that can utilize some of these ideas and understand us, inevitably, like with time, you know, that, that old phrase like, monkeys will write uh right what is it romeo and Juliet, shakespeare right shakespeare. so it's like they'll they'll get it we'll get there like i said with a billion data points slowly but surely over time we'll understand right now there are really smart models that understand what a joke is and understand what um what like unpleasantness is just from a tweet right right they can they can take a look at things like hate speech and say like oh this is potentially hate speech and give it a ranking even though facebook and twitter are having a big time struggle we have a pretty good idea. When it comes down to understanding and, and recognizing things and whether they have context or not, I don't think machines have to understand why there's context. They might just make a connection saying like, when somebody says when in Rome, they're referring to this thing that I've learned over time. It doesn't make sense necessarily to that, that, that thing reading it, but it'll understand the context. Meaning though, I think it's defined by the user. Your idea of what like meaning is, is like very different from the my, my meaning is. For instance, you know, I talked about I talked about uh, Avengers a minute ago. My bunny thinks there's a lot of meaning in Avengers Endgame. I think there's none, and we're two different people with the same with the same outlooks ish, and what's coming at us is still defined by somebody else. So, if if you're trying to say like if you're trying to ask if I think I'm getting this correctly, if you're trying to ask will will robots be able to judge what meaning is based as defined by us? I think I think if we can put those things into like if we can write them down and put things into terms, yes. Will it understand poetry? Yeah. Uh, will it understand how to like connect things of abstract form? Potentially not, but I think over time it will. Um, as long as it like, because you gotta remember like 
my information passed down from my generations previous is only so much. But if I have an entire being that has all the historic data of the entire planet, generations over, it's going to get all contacts inevitably. Yeah. And it'll make connections that we've never seen before. But this is like, this is like a, a loving, like way far out, way, way far away construct, but it's not a today for Okay. Hey, so let to wrap it off. Let's let's wrap it up. Let's come back down to earth and maybe um, let's. So, as product designers, what is there? Maybe there's a some kind of tool or app I should check out. You know, um, considering that you know when your head is down and you're designing apps and you're dealing with stakeholders and you're you know it's the day to day designer stuff that you deal with. Um, are there any tools out there right now that I could? utilize that would help me in my day to day? Yeah, um, there's a couple. It depends on what you're doing. If you're if you're a UX designer like you and I um, or like product designer in general, um, the tools are much smaller. You don't have a, tons of opportunity um, because there's this is not an area that's been heavily disrupted yet. If you're looking for logos, if you're doing like traditional graphic design, like the sites that I mentioned previous, like Luka or like um, B12 or even Wix will do a really good job of generating ideas for you. In fact, there's an entire section of Lookout that just says like, look, you can put in what you're look looking for. And if your client is looking for a, a logo or a website, we'll generate it for them. And if you choose it, then you pay. So you can actually use these tools basically for free to generate like fun ideas. Um, another one is there's a handful of language models that are coming on the market that allow you to put in decent body copy or even do things like understand context in large portions. That would be um, GPT-2 from OpenAI. There's another one offhand that I can't remember, but those are the ones that are most accessible. If you want to start to do things where you get into like more challenging opportunities in regards to things like a segmentation analysis for like user experience research, you don't have to start taking a look at things like TensorFlow or um, other like kind of slightly more heavy on the development side. And this is where it's not really about applications that you can use best. This is where like your best programming friends are your are your best tools or friends. Right. So yeah. reach out to them and find out and see if like they can help you bridge that gap because. It turns out that some of these opportunities of just um, finding insights based on, let's say, like user testing or yep. um, on like early uh, user analysis is a lot easier than we think it is. And we can get really, really good amount of data out of small, small segments that we might actually not notice today. And it takes, and honestly, it removes a whole chunk of just like sitting there and typing a report. So yep. for anybody who's looking at research, there are lots of good opportunities. There's a handful of good medium articles uh, out right now on basically all of this. So uh, take a look around and try to find like that thing. I think if you just look at like UX uh, in machine learning, you'll find quite a bit of information on just um, how, to, how to just take all of your information, report it and make it a lot easier. Okay. Excellent. Excellent <laughs> stuff. Okay. Okay. Thanks am, very yeah. much, Michael, for coming and, <laughs> and chatting with me on this uh, nice balmy you. Thursday Bye. afternoon. I, I'm assuming you're in Toronto right now. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 It's hot. In, uh, I'm out in Scarborough and it's, it's about 40 right now and it's a little oh, warm. It's, so it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, I'll let you go and you can go enjoy some of that hot weather. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thanks again. See ya. Bye.